Do you hear that? That's the sound of that Obama fella. And the wind he's blowing from his behind. Well, you're tuned in to Death Metal Chronicles. So today we've got some interesting, uh, interesting stuff. We got some decent uh, feedback from our uh, resident ranger for the Unsung Heroes of War section. Ranger speaks. Comrade Obama sucks up to Ukraine guy. Continue to say to the Russian government that uh, if it continues on the path that it is on, then not only us, but the international community, uh, the European Union, and others uh, will be forced to apply a cost to uh, Russia's uh, violations of international law and its encroachments on Ukraine. Uh, there's another path available, and we hope that uh, President Putin. Is willing to seize uh, that path, uh, but uh, if he does not, uh, I'm very confident that the international community will stand strongly behind uh, the Ukrainian government uh, in preserving its unity and its territorial integrity. Mr. President, it's all about the freedom. We fight for our freedom, we fight for our independence, we fight for our sovereignty, and we will never surrender. My country has faced a number of challenges. The military one is a key challenge today. And we urge Russia to stick to its international obligations, to pull back its military into barracks, and to start the dialogue. With no guns, with no military, with no tanks, but with the diplomacy and political tools. Double arm speaking. You're tuned in to Death Metal Chronicles. And, uh, that was according to, uh, New York Times. They put that out. Hope we won't get taken down for that, but, you know, hey. Play is gonna play. Haters gonna hate. Obama makes diplomatic push to defuse crisis in Ukraine. President Obama and Ukraine's interim prime minister opened the door on Wednesday to a political solution that could lead to more autonomy, uh, autonomy for Crimea if Russian troops withdraw, as the United States embarked on the last-ditch diplomatic effort to defuse the crisis that reignited tensions between the East and the West. The tentative feeler came as Mr. Obama dispatched Secretary of State John Kerry to London to meet with his Russian counterpart on Friday. Two days before a Russian support referendum in Crimea on whether to, whether to cede from Ukraine, Mr. Obama said the world would completely reject what he called a slapdash election, but added he still hoped for a peaceful settlement. In a show of solidarity for the besieged Ukraine, Mr. Obama hosted a White House visit by, I might even try to say this guy's name, uh, Arseny Pijakunyuk, the country's pro-Western acting prime minister, and vowed to stand with Ukraine, but he hinted at a formulation that could be the basis of coming talks between Mr. Kerry and Sergei Lorov, the Russian foreign minister recognizing Moscow's interest in helping the Russian-speaking population in Crimea after helping what is in part of Ukraine. Mr. Obama said Mr. Yakinik told him that a new Ukrainian government formed by the election scheduled for May the 25th could find ways to address Crimea's concerns. There is a constitutional process in place and a set of elections that can move forward on that. In fact, could lead to a different arrangements over the time with the Crimean region, Mr. Obama said. But that is not something that can be done with the barrel of a gun pointed at you. Thus saith Mr. 
Obama who killed an American citizen in Pakistan? Okay. You got some balls there, buddy. At a separate appearance later in the day, Mr. Yakin expressed willingness to consider concessions to Crimea. We, the Ukrainian government, are ready to stand, ready to start a nationwide dialogue how to increase the rights of autonomous Republic of Crimea, starting with taxes and ending the other aspects, like language issues, he told an audience at the Atlantic Council. God, it's fucking creepy. Any such discussion, he added, had to take place in a constitutional manner, rather than imposed by Russian troops, but he did not rule out holding a local referendum if authorized by the Ukrainian parliament. Only afterward, this referendum could be a constitutional one, he said. <sighs> and this article just keeps going and keeps going and keeps going and keeps going and going and going. Let's do a quick search. Constitution of United States to dictate foreign trade. Well, you got the Commerce Clause. foreign trade. So you could say that the supremacy clause of the Constitution could also be part of that. I'm pretty certain that the president is only the president of the military. He is not the president of foreign relations to another government, and I'm fairly certain that those powers that are supposedly derived by we the people are only to America. And entangling alliances will only get you shit in a shit pot. We really do need somebody else like, you know, Ron Paul or Napolitano or Michael Scheuer, or even Val Valerie Plame Wilson, which I don't really agree with everything that Valerie Plame, you know, says. You know, she's on, she's kind of a, a left-centered middle person. Um... But she's fairly legit. Going on her blog. I haven't been on her blog in a while. She's got a bunch of books. She's got Fair Game, Blowback. Um, oh, she did something with the Time, Time uh, Magazine thing. She did some sort of video thing. That's pretty cool. And she is smoking. I know she's old enough to be my mom and all, but oh man. <laughs> she's totally foxy. The NSA's metastasized intelligence industrial complex is ripe for abuse. That's one of her articles. That was the middle of last year. She must be writing, she was writing on some other. Um, Wow, she's 50? Holy cow. No way. Well, I guess so. Yeah, I guess she hasn't really written anything lately. She's probably just hiding out in the middle of the woods. Or just touring with her or her books and stuff like that. Um, I'm really impressed. She just... Now, what's interesting is, so, like, the guys from Soft Rep and, like, um, Valerie Plame and um, other people 
have been having to write non or fictional books so that they can describe events <laughs> without direct um, quotations and such. I'm really confused by this, but it gets the ideas out there. So it's declassified, I guess. Gotta do what you gotta do. Uh... I guess she's involved with the Santa Fe Institute. Yeah, she's hiding out in the woods, in the desert, out there. And good for her. She still has her citizenship, she's not in jail. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> so found through soft rep they had linked it for um, a fitness portion of their um, of one of their articles um, let's see if I still had up here uh, physical training in a tier one unit and they had linked to an Army Times article Rangers get raw to enhance performance so Read a little bit of this, and then we'll we'll go through our our buddy uh, our Rangers um, kind of viewpoints on it. The 75th Ranger Regiment is always looking for the Army's best soldiers. Once they become Rangers, the unit wants them to keep sharp for their intense training and deployment tempo. The regiment has been continuously deployed since September 11th, and Ranger fitness has been critical to its success. Leaders say through its Ranger Athlete Warriors. Uh, program raw the ranger the regiment uses the latest concepts in functional fitness resilience sports medicine and nutrition to optimize human performance within the ranks raw has been around since 2006 official says said but leaders are emphasizing the rewards and sinking more resources into the system to maximize effectiveness rangers are always looking for an edge to get better faster and stronger they already have that elite athlete mentality said major major robert monts the, the regimental occupational therapist and officer in charge of the raw program there are tons of resources out there we thought, let's get some subject matter experts on board who know this stuff and make sure our rangers are truly doing, doing the right things to become more elite. The program is built around four pillars, functional fitness, performance nutrition, mental toughness, and sports medicine. It incorporates multiple disciplines and takes a holistic approach to keeping rangers in the fight, factoring in the extreme environments they routinely operate and train in. Wants of the components address every need for optimal range of performance, and they're not just a matter of working out hard. Regimens must be appropriate to the physical requirements, fueled by sound nutritional practices, and designed to prevent avoidable overuse injuries, he said. With the mind fully engaged, any injuries that do surface should be addressed promptly and thoroughly. That's the whole continuum. Everything a ranger needs to be operational. This program brings all the dynamics into one, he said. There isn't a recipe formula online for becoming a better ranger. For NFL and college players, there's a science, there's a nice science out there already for how a linebacker can become a better linebacker. Raw is specific for the mission sets rangers need to do in combat operations. No. Where's the actual? F they talk about it, but where's? I'm not seeing like the actual workout. 
and just talk about the concept of it. They link to some Fort Benning things. <laughs> I love how the military uses their own encryption keys for HTTPS. It's so fucking funny. Bunch of fuckers. <laughs> And some guy forgot the L and HTML. Motherfucker. HTTPS. This shit pisses me off to no end. The fucking government does this shit all the fucking time. I guess it doesn't exist anymore. They were supposed to put up their like physical exam thing or some shit like that. The raw PT guide. Oh geez, the PDF. God. What have I done? It's only 3.2 megabytes. And it, Jesus Christ. This is doing 1.8 megabytes a second? What the hell? What kind of server is this from? <laughs> this is ridiculous. <laughs> Like the backwoods of Fort Benning. <laughs> the Ranger Athlete Warrior Program. Faster, harder. Further, faster, harder. Oh god. This is like 82 pages. Control injuries, blah 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 blah. Jesus Christ, I'm getting PowerPointed to death. If I actually had the time, I would totally like put this up for the video just to fuck with you guys. Calisthenics, sidestep lunges, corkscrew lunges, walking lunges and reach, walking bends and reach, verticals down and back, laterals down and back, crossovers down and back, shuttle runs. Oh god. And there's actually descriptions. This is fucking hilarious. <laughs> the fucker doesn't have a damn PT belt though. <laughs> oh god. Bend and reaches, uh squats with no whatever. Walking in place. I don't understand why Jesus Christ. Mountain climbers. I guess just do a bunch of shit. I'm so confused. I really don't. And this is 82 pages. Like some guy got paid however much money to do this. Um, uh, Do two sets of single leg squats. 15 reps each leg. Pull up ropes. Pull ups and ropes. Two sets of 12. Uh, do some supine twists for a minute. I really don't understand why. Oh, okay. Well, now we'll, uh, from that, our, uh, resident ranger from the Unsung Heroes of War, Ranger Speaks! I need to get him a theme song. The raw program is well-intentioned and may have its merits, but in my opinion, it is dreamt up by strength physical trainers, physicians, assistants, coaches, and kinesiologists. I'm not really kinesiologists. I'm not sure how you're supposed to say it. Um, that have all the time in the world to life and breath and think fitness 24/7. For the average ranger that is constantly either deployed training for deployment or recovering from a, from a deployment, there is not time to implement all this raw jazz. In my opinion, it is a bust. One of those comments that Briefwell 
<laughs> and PowerPoint well. <laughs> That's my ad. That doesn't implement well. I don't know if anyone is still doing the raw stuff. I'll have to ask some of my deployed rangers over there with me. I know from 2009 to my retirement in 2012, we did a couple of raw assessments and experiments when mandated. But I did not personally implement any raw stuff into my workouts, and not many that I know did either. We still just ran, rucked, did push-ups, sit-ups, lifted weights, crossfit, ollie-style lifts, and old curls for the girls variety. And that's a Ranger Speaks. That's his mindset on it. For deployed fitness, um, I started implementing something that really helped me. So I started reading a lot of different things where people talked about how BMI is attributed to um, steps per day as opposed to um, distance running or um, exerted running, say just doing sprints. So what me and a bunch of my buddies started doing is we just put on a fucking rucksack and just fucking walked our base every fucking day. Did like 10 miles and, and did that and it worked and it was pretty sweet and it helped out. Hey, is that Jose? Hey, Jose. How's it going, buddy? Did you clean today? Mm, yeah. Yeah. There's coffee if you want some. And I made chicken. Well, that's another thing for you guys that are deployed. Don't eat any of the crazy ass shit they, they put in front of you. Eat salad with mustard and tuna. Yeah, there's those two containers there. There's like sweet potatoes and chicken inside of them. That's what I was doing when I was deployed. Get some fucking salad, tuna, mustard. Every fucking day. Three meals a day. Per day. Three meals per day. Salad, tuna, mustard. And if you can get it, get egg whites. Uh, if you can, don't eat those fake eggs. That's the worst shit you could possibly, I don't know what it is, but it's definitely not eggs. That fucking liquid eggs shit, I don't know what that is. I don't know why the government gives it to people, but... It's cheap. It's fucking and green is what it is. <laughs> it's probably human flesh. <laughs> From Socknet. No, this is not for an enlistees. You kids should focus on the basics. Push-ups, sit-ups, pull-ups, two-mile runs, five-mile runs, eight-mile rucks, and 12-mile rucks. The major changes in RAW over the last two years are as followed. During a single 90-minute PT session... Tasks 8 and 9 and 10 require gym equipment and are conducted separate from 1 and 7, but within four, blah, 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 blah. The Illinois Agility Test, the 4-kilogram basic overhead medicine ball, the metronome pull-up, push-ups, pull-ups, 30-yard scuttle run, shuttle run, heel claps, 20-minute 20 meter shawl runs. Gymmed base assessments. Deadlifts with the barbell at 225 pounds. Max reps. Bench press with barbell at 185. Man, it's impressive. If you're a fucking skinny ass dude. When you were when you were uh, in the Marine Corps, what was your max bench, Jose? And you're, you're like 105 pounds, right? Maybe 120? No, 140, dude. You were 140 pounds. And yeah, I weighed like 140. No, actually 135 pounds. 135? That's pretty badass, dude. I, I could definitely see if you, you could totally get up to really, really high, but your risk of injury is going to get like really up there. 
one day you're gonna go for 200 pounds, you're just gonna fucking rip your fucking bicep or your, your shoulder right out, you know? What was your deadlift? I deadlifts. You didn't do deadlifts? Dude. What was your squat at least? What did you squat today? I've only, I've only like worked out as much as I do right now for about a year. That's it. Really? Before that, I was just running and shit. What was your run time in the Marine Corps? Two years. What? What was your run time in the Marine Corps? Before? Hmm? Well, they made us run the, the half mile. A half mile? And I ran it like 11.30. Oh, mile and a half or whatever. A mile and a half and 11.30? Yeah. It's pretty fucking badass, dude. Especially, when well, you were how old then? Like 17, 18? <laughs> 17, 18? Oh, jeez. Yeah. <laughs> I can't imagine old guys along with you, like my age, like, you know, 29, 32, you know, fucking <laughs> huffing and puffing, you know, like, you fuckers! <laughs> Um, I, well, I did it when I went to, uh, to Blackwater's training thing. I, uh, here I am fucking, I think I was 27 or 28 when I went there. I think it was 27. And I did the qual for it. And I think I did my mile and a half in like 13 minutes or something like that, you know? I was like one of the last guys. One of the fucking oldest dudes. Like, there was this one kid, he was like a 20 year old veteran. He had got out to two years as a reservist. Got out, smoked everybody. I think he did a mile and a half in eight minutes or something like that. It was like the fastest run you could ever do in Blackwater. And he did it. And he was a Marine. Semper, Semper Pi. <laughs> Two accounting Marines. <laughs> Putting mathematics in the Marine Corps. <laughs> Oh God! Yeah, so for you guys who were uh, trying to up your up your fitness, you might want to try the raw program. I think mean, it, it works. I mean, if you're if you don't have to do like PFTs or anything like that, and you want to do something new, something a little bit different, um, get off the CrossFit stuff. Um, maybe try something different to go back to CrossFit if you want to go back to it. Um, I'm not a CrossFitter. I do. I've done a couple of the workouts while I was deployed with some of my friends, but I'm not really to uh, I'll say this I appreciate the sprinting I appreciate the deadlifts but I think when you start getting into like mechanics where you're moving weight so say you're doing a clean and pull I think a clean and press or you call it where you take basically it's it's a if you're not familiar with it it's basically a deadlift and then you bring it up above your head which I agree that you should be able to use the mechanics of weight and be able to use the distribution of it to get it above your head and maybe bring it down. What I don't agree with is when it's just for the mechanics of the movement to where it's this full body movement and you're just doing it to move the weight. And I really don't... I see that your risk of injury is more... Physical therapists that I've been talking to have been telling me that more and more of their athletes are coming to them and saying, hey, I have this injury due to doing kettle kettleballs, to doing, you know, these CrossFit workouts, which are good workouts. They're, you just need to actually have a trainer to be able to teach you the mechanics of the movement and that it's not just for moving the weight, it's actually to have control over it, I guess. I don't know. I, I just see so many injuries and hear so many guys getting injured with it. I like it. I think it's cool. I just, I just don't do it myself. Um, although, for my purposes, I've given up on doing uh, squats. Um, now I only do um, deadlifts and I will do dumbbell squats, you know, like on the sides of your legs, um, doing those. Um, leg presses, so I actually got up to doing 800 pounds. I don't really think I'll go above that. Um, I've kind of held back on, I kind of went back down to about, between 400 and 600 pounds in between there, um, working on the muscle groups and things like that with control. Um, I find that for me personally, heavier weight, um, my risk for injury is a lot more and my recovery time is a lot less. So 
when I actually went up to doing 800 pounds leg press, I ended up uh, having flu symptoms. I had like a cold for like an entire week. My immune system just said no, and obviously I needed more rest, and I probably needed more um, calories within my diet, especially while I was while I was working out as well. Um, what the military doesn't train you to do is eat, and they don't train you to eat well, or having a balanced diet. But they don't really feed you anything. So like any of the bases that I've been to deployed, the only places that I actually had decent food were the NATO bases where they had um, people from the Pacific. And I lived in Hawaii for a long time, and so I, I really enjoyed um, being there with those guys from the Pacific. Um, and all the food was fish, rice, salad, vegetables, fruit. You know, they didn't have uh, french fries, and they didn't have fake eggs, and they... I don't even know what the military feeds these guys sometimes. Like, fucking just pasta after pasta after pasta and just high glycemic carbs. Sure, you can add high glycemic carbs and you can burn those carbs if you're operating and doing things. Your body sees calories as calories. It doesn't necessarily see them as good or bad necessarily. Now, the the complexity of the, the amino acids that you're getting into your body do make a difference in what your performance is. So you can take down an uh, entire Gatorade while you're burning a bunch of calories, and that's actually positive for your body. If you're you know, an athlete or you're conducting um, operations and you need to burn constant calories, which is actually a good thing. The difference is, is when you're fobbing it out and you're hanging out at some fucking base and you're taking down a fucking tang all fucking day and those fucking whippets and shit like a rippets um, you only know about those, you've been fucking deployed, and, uh, you know, if you're drinking that shit, you know, you've got, you're running 20 or 30 grams of sugar into your body, and you're spiking your, for something that has a glycemic index of, of 80 or 90 percent, you're basically just, you just, you basically just drink fucking insulin, I mean, there's no, there's no real point in you drinking that, what you're doing is you're just spiking your blood sugar, so then you're going all the way up, and then you totally fucking crash. And I think, I don't know what the, the scientific data is on your daily consumption, your your blood sugar, and how if you constantly spike your blood sugar going up and down and up and down, that in a 30-day cycle, that this would probably affect your sleep as well. So it's kind of all tied together and if you're operating you do need to focus on it and really for me the only thing that I found that helped me was eating fish, uh, solid meats, uh, any of that mystery meat shit, any of that fucking fucking Taco Tuesdays shit where you don't know what it is it's some sort of soy protein stuff ugh, I, I don't know what it is sometimes, it's fucking like fake chicken and fake beef and shit like that so for me what I did fucking tuna. I knew that tuna was a solid protein. I knew that it had the amino acids that I need. I knew that it had the fat that I need because fat's an essential um, amino acid to the body. Um, and it has the protein that you need because, you know, a 200 pound guy needs at least 20 grams to 50 grams of protein per meal. So if you're just eating pasta, you're only going to get 10 grams of protein per cup. So then you have to eat five to six cups worth of fucking pasta, which then, if your body is breaking down pasta, if it's made from a glutinous carbohydrate, then all you're getting is sugar. Sure, you're getting a portion of the protein that you need, but you're not getting the actual protein that your body requires to operate. So you really do need to think about this and, and what you're doing. So these workouts and these things are very, very good, but you also have to think about what is your diet? What are you, if you're, if you're waking up in the morning and you're eating fucking cinnamon crunch or whatever the hell people eat this, you know, the morning these days, all of that is a sugar spike. It's not a complex, slow digesting carb. There's no real protein in it. I mean, and especially if you're only getting it from milk as well, milk is only going to be around eight grams of protein and then you're going to get another 300 grams of carbohydrates. So how 
does that equal out for your body? What's your body going to utilize that with? You know, you start moving around, you start doing stuff, you're easily going to burn off all those calories very, really quick. And if you don't have a slow digesting protein and a slow digesting carbohydrate in your body, you're not going to be able to operate. Which means you need to be eating fucking tuna, you need to be eating eggs, you need um, starches, starchy carbs, potatoes, sweet potatoes, um, yams, things like that. Um, that really helps you. For me, that's what that's what works. And really for my diet right now, what I've been doing lately is I, to slow down my money consumption as well, I just buy fucking a case of chicken, three or four pounds of sweet potatoes, bake that, uh, I'll bake maybe uh, three pounds of sweet potatoes and a case of, uh, like a case of chicken for the week, and that's what I eat. Simple. Now that I'm, you know, not deployed, it's actually really easy for me. Um, deployed? No, uh, it's a little bit different. You have to do a little bit more to, to figure out what, what you can and cannot do. Oh, yeah. You know, I love the guys at Soft Rep, but sometimes, I swear. So, Brandon Webb. He's an awesome guy. You know, he's got some great reporting. Sometimes you just gotta separate some propaganda. So, modern day Navy SEALs losing their maritime technology edge. Navy SEAL teams were founded at the direction of President John F. Kennedy in 1962 with the main objective of establishing a unit within the U.S. Navy that could conduct guerrilla warfare in maritime and riverine environments. Long before the first SEAL teams were established, the 1960s, the SEAL community had a rich history reaching back to the OSS swimmers of World War II and the UDTs, underwater demolition teams that supported SOG Special Operations Group with their amphibious landing at Ichon, Korea in 1950s. I don't actually have a subscription to SoftRep, so I can't read the rest of this article because I haven't paid for it. But you guys can pay for it if you want to read the rest of that article. I love them, but it's not entirely true. Supposedly, Navy SEALs losing their maritime technology edge. Okay. So you got guys that are in the Arabian Peninsula, they're around Africa entire carrier groups and fleets of sailors and marines and, and MARSOC guys and Navy SEAL guys attached to those dudes and they're running operations and stuff. But where does the money go? It's going to operations. It's going to contractors to pay to train these guys. Which is a good thing, whatever. But if you've got, you know, if there's 3,000, roughly 3,000 Navy SEALs right now, um probably double it to about 6,000 with support for those guys and then add another 1,000 uh, MARSOC dudes. Uh, this is billions of dollars. This is like, there's, they have black budgets that you can't even know the amount of money they're spending on a program, let alone to the black budget that's, that's given to the contractor so they can train these guys or support them. It's not necessarily a good or bad thing, it just kind of is. But they're not talking about, at least from what I've seen for the article, but it's really misleading. You know, saying that, oh, there's not enough money and they're losing their edge, things like that. Well, I don't know where he's going with the article. But in general, in my opinion, I really don't see, I don't agree with the fact that, you know, we need more money now. And, and uh, oh yeah, well, I was, the show that I did earlier that didn't actually get recorded, um... General Jim Amos, you know, is talking about how, you know, they take the Marine Corps down to 175,000 people. Well, maybe they should just take it down to zero people. Why not? Make the Marine Corps a volunteer Marine Corps entirely, not a standing Marine Corps at all. And the only way that Obama can use the Marine Corps again is for actually attacked. Call it a day. Same thing with the Navy SEALs. Make it a volunteer thing. Disband 
uh, the entire standing army and uh, do it like Switzerland does. I was reading up on Switzerland and uh, I actually am very interested in the way their government works. Um, this is really cool about Switzerland's president. So Switzerland does not have a full-time president. The representational functions of a president are taken over by one or all of the government members. Every year, each member of the government team is elected federal president in turn, so every government member assumes the role once in seven years. The president is primus inter pares, first among equals, with very limited special powers. He or she sets the agenda of the weekly conferences and leads the discussion and addresses the population on the 1st of January, 1st of August, the national holiday, and similar occasions represent Switzerland on some international conferences. Often the government is represented by one or two other members. However, depending on the focus, official foreign guests are usually welcomed by the government in corporate, corpore, corpore, all members. For 2011, Switzerland's president, Micheline Calmire. For 2012, it'll be Eveline Wildemir Schlumpfus turn, but nobody wants to predict what happens after the parliamentary elections, given the fact that she was elected against the will of her party, SVP, and excluded afterwards. I think it's pretty interesting. I say do something even more radical in America. Not have representative government. Oh, the whore, but who will build the roads? What I mean is not having representative government in the sense that you don't have anybody that actually represents you. You represent yourself. So you create a, con a contractual republic. The uh, federal state of the agreeing nations or ne uh, of neighboring states or something. And all states, all cities, uh, the essential... Things are completely disbanded. Um, basically, you have a contractual agreement with whoever you want to have a contract with. Whether that's for roads, whether that's for a militia. You go to a militia society. Um, I don't agree with Switzerland's take on conscription because they, they have a really hardcore... How I became an, uh, a Mennonite and a Baptist is because of the, the Switzerland's in a Baptist role and bringing a Mennonite fashion to America and, and the concept of liberty within Christianity, um, just the, the just being set apart, you know, that you're just a different type of person. And I don't agree with the conscription part about it because I don't feel that someone owns your body. So if you're a Satanist or you're whatever, you own your body. So I don't see how Switzerland is allowed to say that you have to be conscripted. That's bullshit in my opinion. But... It's prevented them from going on all-scale war for the past 200 years. So, you know, I think it works, at least to their betterment. And I actually think that model would actually really work well in America, that you just disband the entire um, two-party system. You're not allowed to have parties. <laughs> I don't party, as the uh, tech syndicate uh, t-shirt goes. And, uh... No representative government. Everybody represents themselves. I have a voice. No one else gets to speak for me. And uh, if I want to pay for the uh, the mercenary army, I pay for the mercenary army. If I want to pay for uh, people to have socialized medical care, I pay for that. If I want to pay for people to use opiates and get high all fucking day and hang out and do jack shit, I can pay for that. Or if I don't, then I don't. And then you can put it on your resume. Oh, I paid for the invasion of Uganda because I fucking hit the Ugandans. Or, you know, I, oh, I paid for Obama's family in Indonesia so they can be Indonesians, whatever, you know. You put it on your resume, and you're like, oh, I paid into the National Endowment for, you know, bloodthirsty, you know, Cthulhu people. Why vote for the lesser of evils, you know? <laughs> like, 
Fuck Cthulhu. You know, you just put it on your resume. You know, it's put it on your car. You know, you have you know you wouldn't have to have license plates anymore either, so you wouldn't have that cost. You wouldn't have direct income taxes either because you wouldn't need direct income taxes. Google would want to run fiber alongside the road. Fucking run fiber alongside the road and pay for your road. You don't, you know, government doesn't need to build roads, and they certainly don't need to be in charge of a standing army. There's no possible way that, that at these days, that it even makes any sense at all to have a standing army where you can just have decentralized militias that are not to allow, not allowed to invade anybody, and they're only allowed to be a reactionary force to uh, someone bringing force upon them. Simple as that. People get to marry whoever they want, or not marry who they want. Sounds pretty good to me. That's been Death Note Chronicles. I think that's good enough for today. The world is ending. Obama wants your soul. The modern day Navy SEALs are losing all their funding. Switzerland has an awesome government. Oh yeah, and I uh, got to see War of Ages. They're a metal band. They're like metalcore, so they've got a little different sound. Um, kind of melodic. It's kind of uh, there's a lot of death, grind kind of stuff in their music. Um, I got to talk to the lead singer, um, Leroy. Uh, I got to meet all the guys. They're a fantastic band. Um, they're signed to Face Down. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to play them or not on this episode. Hopefully in another episode I will. I need to contact their, their manager um, to be able to, to see if I'm allowed to play their music or not <laughs> before I get in trouble. But uh, I got to go see those guys, and they're really cool. And uh, they're just down-to-earth gentlemen. And uh, they got regular jobs. They do regular shit. They got kids. You know, they do their thing. And they chew around. They play shows. And they kick it, so... Definitely support War of Ages. I'll uh, throw up their uh, their page, and you, know, you can buy their new albums um, and uh, get some of their merch. Um, they don't make a lot of money. Probably only make 40, 40 grand, thirty grand a year each for a five member band. So definitely support War of Ages. They are they're amazing gentlemen. Spend Death Metal Chronicles. Unsung Here's War, Ranger Speaks, and uh, that Indonesian guy needs to uh, leave Ukraine alone. <laughs> Peace.